Good afternoon to everyone um, in attendance to the training the next generation of criminal justice leaders. Uh, my name is Carla LaRoche. I am a clinical professor at Florida State College of Law, and I will be your moderator for the next few hour, um, few minutes, right? Um, for most of it, you'll be hearing from our amazing panelists. Uh, before we start that aspect of um, our one hour together, I wanted to give a special thank you to April Fremer, uh, Fraser Camara, the uh, chair of the um, American Bar Association Criminal Justice Section, who selected this panel as one to uh, represent the section, and also for the powerful uh, theme that um, will run throughout this whole um, two days discovering the wounds of a tainted truth. Um, and also to thank Jamie Campbell, the senior meeting planner for the ABA criminal justice section and uh, the staff of the criminal justice section overall for their support, their guidance and their patience. Um, with that, I will go into, I will publish the poll that I would like, um, that I request that P attendees uh, fill out or respond to really quickly while I also give the name and the positions of our panelists today. I will not go over their bios because we have limited time, uh, time and they have done so much. Um, and so an hour would not be enough to go through even one of their bios, let alone, let alone four of them. Uh, in order of questions um, in our next section, um, Miriam, Mariam Aranjani is the Associate Professor at University of New Mexico School of Law. Jody Polk is the Director of the Legal Empowerment and Advocacy Hub. Dr. Bria Willingham is the Associate Professor of Criminal Justice at the State University of New York at Plattsburgh. And Ola Remy, sorry, I was about to say Jody again. Ola Remy, aka Remy, um, Obayodan, is a joint degree student at the Florida State College of Law, Florida State University College of Law, and the College of Social Work. So now that, and I just want to remind people uh, just to, so we know who's in the room, um, please fill out the poll really quickly to indicate what your current position is, whether it's academic law school, academic law school not teaching criminal law, um, academic generally, um, not law school, whether you're a law student, pre-law, um, public defender, prosecutor, or other. Um, and I will then see that we have represented, a representation from the law school, non-teaching criminal law, and then some law students um, and prosecutor and other. Um, so glad for the diversity of those in the room, um, and you will hear from diverse people um, in this panel to reach you as well. With that, the goal of the panel is this, to understand what law schools and pre-law schools are doing to prepare those who go into the criminal justice profession. Are we prepping them to discuss the theme of this Institute, Advancing 21st Century Criminal Justice, Discovering the Wounds of a Tainted Truth. Are we actually doing that, preparing people for that, preparing them for the truths of a system that incarcerates people? With that, I will then turn it over to each panelist for five to 10 minutes. I will put you on timer um, to answer that question. How, how does the theme of the Institute resonate with you and with your work. First up, Mariam. Sorry, took me a second there to unmute. Um, thank you so much, Professor LaRoche. Um, I miss you. <laughs> and um, I just had to say that. And all of the co-panelists, I'm grateful that um, Professor LaRoche brought us together so that we could meet and hopefully this will be the first of many opportunities we have to collaborate with one another. Um, um, you've asked us to comment on the idea of how the theme resonates, the theme of the Institute, um, Healing Tainted Wounds, 
exposing and healing tainted wounds um, re relates to my work. Um, uh, so I've thought a lot about how to share what I think the role, or my role at least, I won't say what other, you know, other people in my position should do, but I know that um, I view myself as a teacher who happens to be a lawyer, um, not a lawyer who happens to be a teacher, which I think, you know, is the case for many, many law professors um, who are absolutely experts in their areas of expertise. Um, for me, um, teaching and really elevating um, students and particularly students who have traditionally been um, underrepresented, left out, forgotten, mistreated in our educational system. Um, th those are the students that I've, you know, sort of always been um, most interested in, most passionate about, and hope that um, I will go to my grave having spent my career working um, toward. Um, and so I, I view, you know, what my work as a law professor and as chair of our admissions committee at our law school and some of the other um, national work that I do on law-related education and with various groups on trying to um, improve access to the legal profession for students of color, students who are low income, students who are um, first generation in their families to go to college, and other, you know, other students who just are not part of who were envisioned to be to be lawyers, frankly, by our, our system. Um, you know, we, particularly in criminal law, I think representation is important. It's really important in all fields. I mean, there's lots of research in a lot of fields that, that demonstrates that, right? That you have better outcomes. Um, for, exa for example, black women have better outcomes when they go to black um, um, doctors who take them more seriously, who care about their needs, who, um, who help make connections for them um, uh, in ways that unfortunately because of bias, implicit bias and other, other you know, um, pernicious um, forms of exclusion, um, you know, we, we don't see the same rates of success in, in the medical field, for example, um, if people don't go to, um, to uh, don't have access to um, professionals that are um, similar to them. And that isn't to say, you know, of course, I, I'm not saying we should, I, you know, I should only go to women doctors or I should only go to Iranian doctors. Or I, that's not what I'm saying. I, I mean, we're, of course, working toward greater racial justice, but simultaneously, we know that access is important. Um, and we know that people are more likely, again, to get good outcomes um, when they have people like them in the classroom, when they have people like them as their, you know, um, um, you know, every kind of support we need in society. Um, so in particular for me, I view my classroom as a place to um, where, you know, each student has an important voice to contribute. I work really hard to get to know my students, which is, again, not typical in a law school classroom, I think. Um, it's important to me to know, you know, are they parents? Are they grandparents even in some institutions? Um, are they, um, you know, again, first generation? Are they, in our context in New Mexico, um, if they are um, Native American and we have about 10% of our student body is Native, um, you know, did, where did they grow up? Did they grow up on the reservation or, or, um, or not? Um, and, and to truly try to get to know them in an effort to, um, you know, first let them know that I care. I care about who they are as humans. Um, and second, um, hopefully when they know that I care, they'll think, oh, maybe other people care too. And maybe, maybe I do belong in this space. Um, I think imposter syndrome is real for, um, for many students, for many of us, um, you know, not just students. And um, I, I, I think really hard and carefully about how to um, combat it and, um, uh, you know, in the classroom in different ways. Um, I make sure that my hypotheticals, that my exam questions, that my, um, you know, the cases that I choose to teach all reflect the diversity of my particular classroom that semester, not just the diversity of America, but like who is in my classroom right now and how do I make sure that there are, um, you know, if, if I know that there are students, for example, who are struggling with their sexual orientation, how can I bring that into the classroom um, in ways that, you know, de um, deactivate the sting that, that is associated with whatever that identity is um, and give people a real sense of empowerment about who they are and why their voice matters in the legal system. Um, 
I, I'd be happy to talk more specifically about, you know, examples of things, but, but I guess, you know, I think overall my, I'd love to hear from the other panelists as well on what they do, but I would just say, you know, we're at a really special moment in legal education, in my view, um, where, uh, you know, we have not really made any progress with regard to diversity, racial and ethnic diversity in the ways that we need to. Um, for our society to see lawyers that look like them, again, who, who reflect their interests, that reflect their background, understand what they've gone through, what their communities have gone through. We have made a lot of progress with regard to gender um, balance um, in, in law schools. We're, I think we're in the third year in a row of um, majority women entering across the country uh, into law schools. And that's wonderful. But I, I think we have a lot of work to do with regard to racial and um, ethnic diversity. And, and I hope to, um, to really, you know, play a role in, in promoting, promoting that, working with lots of other partners and interested people. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, for those introductory pieces. Um, regarding what the theme means to you. Um, you mentioned empowerment, and the next person to speak is the director of Legal Empowerment and Advocacy Hub. Um, so Jody Polk, I'm gonna pass it off to you to talk about what the theme means to you in light of training the next generation of criminal justice leaders. Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Carla and everyone for um, allowing me to just be represented and share my voice on this panel. Um, I, my journey started uh, within the incarceration of local Black neighborhoods inside of Alachua County. I am a Florida native, um, as well as during my eight-year experience in the Florida Department of Corrections. So when we talk about, you know, discovering and healing those tainted wounds, um, it's very personal for me um, because there was a time um, probably until up about five years ago um, that I truly believed that um, I was the wound. I was living as the wound. And so it wasn't through discovering and learning all of um, the ugliness that, you know, comes with um, law and government and politics and racism and discrimination of actually um, learning those things firsthand, actually on the campaign to restore voting rights um, inside of Florida. And so that was the first time I even learned about, you know, politics or government. And it's been a, a personal journey of my own healing um, of just recognizing who I am and where I come from and not just believe in one narrative. Um, I was incarcerated for eight years, but for 23 years, um, I had experience being incarcerated in the education system, um, being incarcerated inside of my body. And it was no wonder that for me, by the time I went to prison at 23, I was almost relieved. It was like that um, undeniable pathway, you know, had finally come true. There was nothing that I could do to stop myself from going into incarceration. I remember embracing um, incarceration as a natural part of life. And when I went in the inside, um, very shocked to see how similar the incarceration experience was to the actual lived experience of um, being a young Black person inside of the South. And so I had the ability to become a what's called an inmate law clerk, a certified law clerk inside the Florida Department of Corrections. Um, that was my first time ever, along with hundreds and thousands of women, um, that we ever really recognized how much law and policy actually affected our day-to-day -day lives. And through the experience of being a jailhouse lawyer, a law clerk, um, really had to learn how to um, use the same laws and policies that are used to persecute us for liberation. And so that has been a huge part of um, my advocacy now on the outside um, with de developing the Legal Empowerment Advocacy Hub. Uh, we really have two strategies in peace building and legal empowerment, peace building, you know, around trauma informed practices, um, restorative justice, healing through dialogue, peer um, mediation and social emotional learning but also this amazing um, strategy of legal empowerment um, that suggests that people have to know and understand the law 
before they can use and practice the law to then move on to be shapers and transformers of the law. And so we, um, through the Jailhouse Lawyers Initiative, actually work with law students and lawyers all over the country and community organizations to um, bring legal empowerment as well as peace building, um, not just in the local neighborhood and communities, but in the, the actual places of incarceration through law libraries um, to actually um, support our community members coming home um, legally empowered. And so through working with jailhouse lawyers and lawyers and um, law students, um, it's like we're building out our legal ecosystem and actually transforming that cycle of incarceration. Um, Leah is also the first participatory defense hub in the state of Florida, which is um, a community-based organizational tool uh, for families and community organizers who are not lawyers to be able to um, influence the outcome of pretrial phase of the criminal justice system. So due to my own experiences in Florida and just experience of um, having loved ones that are incarcerated for life sentences, minimum mandatory sentences. Um, Leah is actually a post-conviction hub of participatory defense, um, where we as non-lawyers are working to make sure that people still have a fair process, um, even after sentencing, and their post-conviction rights. Also to make sure that people's right to access to the courts and sufficiencies of law libraries um, are actually, that the institutions are being held accountable um, for that. And so, that's a little bit about who I am. Um, I know the theme is criminal justice, but this is really civil justice and human rights, um, you know, to to a lot of us who have lived underneath these um, systems and very proud of the relationships that we have with the legal community um, to really not have to depend on lawyers, but create shared power um, shared learning experience so we as individual people can stand up to injustice, not just in these big systemic ways, um, but even inside of the little ways that shows up every day um, inside of your local community. Thank you, Jody. Um, before we go on to Dr. Willingham, um, I wanted to invite uh, attendees to submit your questions uh, through the questions part on your left, your right hand side of the screen. I can tell my left from my right, it's fine. Um, the uh, right hand part of the screen in the questions and as we go through, I will mark them to potentially ask the panelists. All right, Dr. Willingham, I invite you to um, introduce yourself as well as the connection you have with your, between the, the theme and your work. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Carla. I appreciate it. I am Dr. Bria Willingham, and I am an Associate Professor of Criminal Justice at SUNY Plattsburgh. And um, I teach a, a variety of courses that relate directly to my research, and that includes um, Punishment in Society, Women in the Criminal Justice System, um, race, crime, and justice, and wrongful convictions, and also media crime and criminal justice. So when I, um, oh, just for, as a matter of context too, uh, Plattsburgh is in a, it's a um, predominantly white community. I teach at a predominantly white institution. So that means also that um, we have two uh, prisons, state prisons that are in close proximity to our campus. So um, we are both, I guess you could say, a prison town and a college town. And what's interesting about that is a, a lot of my students will, who are from this area have relatives who teach inside the, the prisons in, in, the, in our area and also some across the state. And then I have students who are from downstate New York, who have relatives who are incarcerated. So at any time, in, in particularly in my punishment and society class, I can have um, you know, a large number of students whose relatives um, work in the prisons and then a large number of students whose relatives um, are incarcerated in the prisons. And so sometimes that presents an interesting, um, interesting dichotomy in the classroom. But, um, for me, um, you know, as it relates particularly to, to tainted truths, um, 
I would say that I deal with distorted truths. And so it is my job to really um, unteach. So everything that my students, and these are primarily white students who are coming into my classroom and they have these ideas based on their relatives' experiences with working in the prison, they have this distorted idea of who incarcerated people are, particularly um, African Americans, because in the in the maximum security prison that's twenty miles from our campus, the um, the population is ninety nine percent African American men and um, Hispanic men, and and the officers are um, ninety nine percent white, and so. My students then will have these distorted truths about incarcerated people. And so it is my job then to, as I said, to un to unteach and, and to challenge their way of thinking. And what's really interesting about that as well is it's not really their way of thinking. It is it is their way. They're just relaying stories um, that they hear from their relatives. And so um and when I'm teaching race, crime, and justice, also, again, it is these distorted truths about um, people of color as a whole in the system. And in particular, when I'm talking about Black men and Black women and how they are, um, you know, killed by police officers and or how they are disproportionately impacted by the um, by the prison system. And so when I am teaching that course as a Black woman, then that adds another layer of of another layer of everything to the discussion. And so I, I often have to spend a, um, a, a significant amount of time, even more time than I would like to, just breaking down their um, preconceived notions about me as a black woman and, you know, challenging them. Um, and, and when they, when I push back on some of the things that they say, then they accuse me of, um of not of not liking them um and you know they'll say things like well dr willingham if you know if you don't agree with her then she won't like you and i'd say it's not about me liking you because this is not a popularity contest for me it is about challenging your way of thinking i'm trying to get them to become informed um, and form informed opinions and, and critically think about these issues as they relate to race, crime, and justice. And so um, I get a lot of pushback sometimes, but I like to push back um, even harder because it's important, especially, especially for the white males who are interested in becoming law, uh, law enforcement officers, whether that's local cops, county cops, state cops, border patrol, you know, it's really, really, it, it is, you know, it, it's really interesting for me to be in a classroom um, as a black woman and I am say, let's say race, crime and justice. And I, and I am, uh, you know, teaching Paul Butler's work, um, for instance, and, you know, to these white, white young men who want to be cops. And for me, it's, it's always interesting because I, sometimes I see them based on things that they say and their body language in class, I can just envision them as Darren Brown. And so it's really hard to, you know, how, how do I maneuver in this space where there are young white men in this room who want to become um, officers who will who may potentially become the next Aaron Brown, and that was the the the, the white cop who killed. Um, um, no, he was maybe it wasn't Darren Brown. I think that was his, I thought that was his name, but killed Mike Brown. First name was Darren. Forget his last name. So anyway, um, so that's that's that is what I'm dealing with when I'm dealing with tainted truths. It's not really tainted; they are distorted truths, and and more often than not, distorted realities. Thank you for that, Dr. Willingham. Um, talking about the classroom and learning the truth versus knowing the truth and seeing your students and your classmates uh, respond to it, I'm going to turn to Remy to talk about, as our uh, representative law student, 
what does this theme mean to you? Good evening, everyone. Um, first, I want to say thank you for having me. Um, no pressure to be the one law student on the panel um, <laughs> talking about the future of criminal justice. Um, my interest is the intersection between law and social work. I think it's so important and I think it's so crucial, um, which is why I'm one of the crazy people that chose to be in law school for four years instead of three. Um, but I'll be done in May. And what I see right now um, with this being my last year is kind of like my last dance in a, um, in a bit because I feel like I'm finding my voice more and I want to speak out more on what I believe is the tainted truth is that we're not getting the full story. Um, so I think that from my perspective, I, I come here with a lot of personal experience um, I feel like my reality growing up in New Orleans was just, it was normal for me and my friends to have family members in prison. Like it was just everyday life. I never thought that it was different. It was normal to take phone calls at holidays and pass the phone around quickly. So we didn't have to pay too much. Like that was just ordinary. Um, I also went to a historically black college, Spelman college where like race was seamlessly integrated into the curriculum. Um, I went back home to be a teacher. I taught sixth grade math in, you know, my zip code where I grew up at a Title I school in New Orleans. And I loved it, but I could really see the connection between criminal justice and my middle school students that I taught. Um, and then I came to FSU and I felt like I would be able to bring some richness to these conversations. But then I realized they weren't always happening in the classroom. Um, I guess for me, it's just kind of like reading cases. I, I'm going to read the case. If I find it really interesting, then I want to figure out like what happened after that. And when I think about cases like um, Montgomery v. Louisiana, you know, that's a post-conviction case, kind of like what Jody was talking about. And we're talking about um, Miller being retroactive. So juvenile life without parole shouldn't be mandatory but we can't talk about that case without talking about this black man being from Louisiana who shot a, a white sheriff in the 60s. Like, that's not even in the case. And like, we need to know that information to understand the context of what's really going on. So I think what has really troubled me, but also motivated me is just, I want to talk about the racial implications and the racial undertones and overtones um, for that matter of what's happening um, in law school. Um, I also feel like we lack conversations about collateral consequences. You know, if I'm interacting with the criminal justice system, there's gonna be, it's not just the incarceration. It's consequences for the family members. There are financial consequences. We've seen there's voting consequences. Like, and when those disproportionately impact people of a certain race, we need to be talking about that in class. And I'm, um, of course, my experience is only one at my school. And I think that my school is trying, you know, but I think what I know, I want to push it further. Um, I'm working with the Black Law Students Association um, on with their national board and just trying to raise the 5%. Um, I think representation matters. And if we want to be able to continue to have these conversations about criminal criminal justice and just the tainted truth, we need to push for the whole story being told. So that's why I'm here. Thank you, Remy. And thank you to each and every one of the panelists for speaking about that tainted truth and what that means to your work. Um, I want to open it up to see if any of the panelists wanted to respond to anything anybody else said before um, we can go into more questions. I just wanted to make one correction. It was Darren Wilson was the name of the officer that was referring to. That's what it was. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And just a reminder, if you have any questions for the attendees, please uh, share them in the chat and we can try to incorporate them into other questions or um, the panelists can respond to them directly. A lot of what we you each have said is about one the distorted or tainted truth um and bringing it to light in the first place uh, having these conversations should how would the ideal curriculum 
look like? What would it look like if there was a mandatory curriculum for people who want to be criminal law practitioners? What would that look like and why? Um, I will, I'll, I'll just say that I think it, um, whatever the curriculum looks like, and it, there has to be a course in, on race in, in the legal system or um, race in the justice system, whatever it, it is called, because that is an important part of this entire um this entire system, the the entire discussion, you know, if we're not talking about race, then we are not having a complete discussion. So, um, and it also needs to include a component on women in the system too, because again, if we're not including women in the discourse, um, in the curriculum, then you are uh, we are sending people out into this field um, totally unprepared. I, I completely agree. And I would just add, um, you know, it's so hard. Academic freedom is, is a real pillar um, of, of, you know, higher education, the idea that professors can sort of teach what they want. But I believe that, that there are more professors that would be willing and able to talk about the, um, the inherent racism, not just in the criminal justice system, but in all aspects of our legal system, if they um, if, if if they were somehow incentivized or required to do so, um, and so I don't know how exactly that would look, but um, but I do think that that uh, it's got to be pervasive. It has to be through the curriculum. I mean, people, you know, at the at the law school level. The idea, I, I've had students tell me that my class and maybe one other, if they took a race in the law class, that, that I, we, those are the only classes that they ever heard a professor mention the role of race in the outcome of a case, which to me is mind boggling at a very diverse, you know, I've, I've only worked at very diverse institutions. Um, so that's surprising to me, but it's a reality. Mm -hmm. And for me, I feel like um, we need healthy um, black history, you know, and not just um, criminalized um, slavery, you know, the doomsday part of how race actually influences the system. But we have to have more healthy um, just historical empowerment and images of um, black people. Also, I feel like... Um, Criminal lawyers should be taught what the actual law is. Um, that is one of the most painful experiences to me as a jailhouse lawyer, now being on the outside to have years of reading the Florida law and knowing the law like the back of your hand and to get inside of courtrooms and use those laws, you know, for protection. And it seems as if um, it's only in the court, in the system, that the law is actually not known or it doesn't um, apply. And we have to also find some type of way to include some type of integrity and personal mm -hmm. healing. I like to say that we can have the best laws and the best policies ever, but it really comes down to the people who are in, um, you know, position to enforce, write, um, govern, interpret, you know, those laws. And that really is an individual, you know, um, practice. And we need to have street law. Um, growing up inside of local neighborhoods and isolated, vulnerable, you know, communities, the law um, in our community, the law that you grow up understanding and knowing is completely different from the law that's inside of the courtroom. And so there's an automatic disadvantage when my life then in intercedes inside of that justice system because we neither one of us absolutely know each other understand each other speak the same um language and i think there should be some mandatory shared lived experience not just meeting us in the jails and the prisons um when it's bad but um having opportunities for these lawyers to actually um have some shared lived diversity you know uh relationship time with the actual communities in the neighborhoods um where these laws begin to really take um root like Remy was um saying and then legal empowerment how can they not just be service providers you know but 
How can they be educators? How can they be teachers? How can lawyers come out of law school prepared to um, give that education away? How can they be better community organizers? How can they be um, better advocates and as well as providing them with skills to stand up for judicial accountability? So I kind of want to build on what Dr. Willingham was saying. Um, my, my concern is a lack of preparation if we don't have these conversations. But I think um, my input on how the curriculum could be changed, I believe that there needs to be a huge cultural shift in what law school looks like and what it feels like, because we're acknowledging that we're not having these crucial conversations about race. But the feeling of anxiety that you feel as a black student going into a law school does not make it a safe space to even talk about this in the first place. Um, so I think that people are smart enough and have the capacity to have these conversations, but I don't believe that they will be fruitful because people are afraid, um, not just law students, professors as well. I think they're afraid um, to really have the conversations in a way that won't step on someone's toes, but I think that that could be remedied by a cultural shift in how we approach law school. Um, not saying that I don't want to be cold called. I don't want to be cold called, but those add to like anxiety and, and distance um, between people that could really have fruitful and powerful conversations um, upon, I mean, in the classroom and upon grad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rec Recognizing that the ideas and the concepts or the classes that you have just proposed do not exist. And recognizing that there has not been an institutional shift. Are we failing those who are going into the criminal justice profession? Because it's been as it as it is right now, it's been 200 years of this. So how then do we grade the profession as a whole right now without those key discussions happening before they become practitioners. For me, and I, I know um, I, I'm the peace builder, you know, and so just my whole life been hard. My whole life has been a struggle. It's just at this point of 36 years of living inside of this body, it just don't make sense for me anymore to, you know, um, connect like all of the collateral consequences there, all of the impact, you know, is there. And honestly, peace building has, you know, um, been my foundation to really stand inside of these justice spaces. Um, but for me, that's why, you know, um, none of those things do exist. Um, none of them have existed. But I guess what gives me hope is just even this national, um, you know, movement of formerly incarcerated people actually going to law school. Um, right now, there are law students like all over this country, you know, that are stepping up and like, you know, um, challenging their institutions and stepping up to their institutions and, you know, um, really standing beside us and opening up, you know, um, the space. Um, my whole advocacy started because of a desire to go to law school. And I'm still, you know, on that journey to get to law school. But I go to law schools all over the country. I, you know, um, share my voice and I share my blackness because I come from the neighborhood. And so a lot of who I am is what is called criminalized, you know, black. And so um, there are a lot of us um, who are used to being uncomfortable, who are used to being ignored, who are used to, you know, um, believing that we're the distorted truth, um, us that have survived you know, this experience and I actually have on my I Survive Lowell CI shirt right now um, mm -hmm. that are intentionally, you know, um, it's going to be stepping into these spaces. Um, I'm going to one day be a prosecutor. I have friends that want to be judges. Um, and we're also inside of, you know, the high schools. We're inside of the prisons. We're inside of the jails. We're inside of the juvenile detention centers. Um, not encouraging, you know, young people or incarcerated people to, you know, join the system. But when people are legally empowered, they don't have those distorted truths anymore of who they can be, um, how they can, you know, actually shape and inform um, these, these systems. So um, I do have, you know, 
hope for the formerly incarcerated um, movement of people who are becoming a part of the justice um, system, as well as I have to just give credit um, to law students, you know, over all over the country who um, are truly not just going on to do the right thing, but, you know, um, really standing beside us um, and demanding that we have space inside of um, these institutions so that we can be interrupters and so that we can be in there to make it a little bit uncomfortable, but also stand in front of those doors if we have to, to say this conversation is going to happen because um, it, it's our lives. If I had to, go ahead. Go ahead oh, I was just going to say, if I had to pick a grade only because I've heard the saying that D's get degrees, I would just, I would just give it a D. Um, and the reason why is because I feel like there's enough to pass, like you can practice, but you just, there's a lot of damage that's going to be done um, with missing a key element of what's going on in criminal justice by not having conversations about race not and not being in a, in a space where that's always valued. Mm -hmm. So I've found like in law school, once you get to your 2L and 3L year, now you can pick your own classes and now you're having conversations that you want to have, you're specializing, but like the foundation doesn't include it. And I, I think that that's not okay. Um, and I think that it's just barely passing if you had to, if I had to um, make a decision. And I said when we met previously, the lack of value on like policy implications in law school is very apparent and how that's always like a secondary argument. And I think that if we continue that, it's just a D for me. Yeah. And and actually, I was going to give it a D as well. So we're on the same we're on the same grade book page. Um, but but I'm coming not from the law school angle, but you know from the undergrad um, angle. And and I say that because of you know just the the um, the students that I see funneling through criminal justice and how some of these programs just nationwide. Um, that are criminal justice um, um, majors, some of them focus heavily and solely on law enforcement as if law enforcement is the only part of the system. And when you have former, former cops who are teaching these classes and not throwing shade, but <laughs> uh, when you have former cops who are teaching these classes, then they become cop shops. And so, um, if we are at the undergrad level training um, people how to become cops, then you're missing an entire part of, well, you're missing two other in equally um, important parts of the system, but you are not teaching um, these students how to effectively um, deal with people who do not look like them. Um, so I, I give it a D and, and while I am not as hopeful as Jody is, and though I am inspired by her passion and, and, and her, you know, her hopefulness, her hopeful out, um, outlook, I would say that I am, um, uh, on some days cautiously optimistic only because it, some of the students that I do, um, interact with, um, you know, they, they, they do want to have these conversations. And so that's why I provide them in, in all of my classes. Um, and um, Remy, I'm the actually the, the um, faculty advisor for our chapter of the National Black Law Student Association. So I am, you know, whenever I, I work with, with those students and, and on projects they, that they do, I'm optimistic because I say, okay, so not everybody wants to be a cop, right? So it is, but at higher at the undergrad level, and I would say even on the graduate level, there a lot more. There's a lot more work that needs to be done, and not just with um, with students, but with professors. Because let's you know, let's be real. Some of these professors, you know, if they could wear their MAGA hats to class, they would. And so when you have those kind of kind of people who are coming into classes, um, you know, teaching and preparing the next generation, then it's no wonder why we are still having this conversation in different spaces. If, if I could just add, I've, I've learned a lot from listening to all of you, and, and I, I really have been just thinking about both the role of formerly incarcerated 
um, individuals going to law school, but just all law students. You know, law schools are actually market driven, even public schools. Um, you know, we're, we're responsive to the market. Who's the market? The market are law students. So if students were to come in and say, and it could be coalitions of students, so the BALSA students working with the APALSA and MALSA and, um, and uh, you know, other diversity groups saying, hey, you know, academic dean, what, what is it that we're doing to teach about race and diversity in our curriculum? Um, across our curriculum, not just in siloed classes. What are we, how are we training first year law professors to teach about diversity um, and outcomes in cases and, and, and also what cases um, they choose to teach and how they teach them? Um, I, I, I really think that's a huge space. And, and um, you know, I'll give you an example somewhat related. Um, we have a student group that recently formed called Moms of Law. And they were, they were accelerated by COVID and the impact of COVID on parents, you know, caregivers right now who are trying to um, work with their own children at home who are at school while they're doing their own learning and in many instances are also working. And, um, you know, that, that student group um, sent a letter to all the first year faculty and said, hey, we're going back into shutdown mode. Here how, here's how it's going to affect us caregivers. Could you please take that into account? in your exam drafting and here are the ways in which you can draft an exam that would be you know more um more sort of responsive to our our situation at this point and you know let me tell you that doesn't happen very often where st students will email all the or, so anyway i it just it, it was an example to me of the way that students can play a really important role and really should and remy i would invite you and other students jody you're going to be a student very soon too um, you know, go for it. Find find people who can who who agree with you and and make a fist. You know, in terms of demanding for the schools to be responsive to the kind of curriculum that you want to see. That um, your comment there, uh, Mariam, just uh, forced me to think of another comment. I mean, a question for you all: the other extreme, where there are individuals who ag agree with the need to reform the criminal legal system, um, put that fist in the air, uh, want to see change, but then they want to work within the system they want to abolish. So how do you have that type of conversation uh, with individuals? They accept the truth, they're ready to fight for it and against it, um, but then need to work within that system they want to then see change completely. Hmm. That's it. So I don't mind saying something um, to that. Um, you know, when I came out of incarceration um, and I was, February will be seven years that I have been home and um, the, you know, there was this big divide of reformists and abolitionists. And if you wasn't an abolitionist, then you wasn't right. And the guidelines that we had to really, you know, um, define what was an abolitionist, you know, honestly just did not connect with my lived experience. You know, even um, hearing Professor Willingham talk about, you know, the professor that wear the mega hats, you know, just to be honest, there are more people of color in my neighborhoods that also have on the mega hats. And, you know, there's these gaps really between the virtual, you know, um, diversity um, and culture and just also the kind of lived now experience, you know, of um, individuals. But it was no way in the world, especially as someone that has come from the inside, that I could only do abolition from the outside. Um, to me, we have been kicking off. Uh, we kicked off a law school tour last year and we're picking it up next year virtually. Um, that says legal empowerment as a proactive, um, you know, strategy for um, abolition, because while we're all on the outside and, you know, we're all demanding, you know, for a 
destruction of this injustice system, um, I just, from the inside out, recognize how that's never going to happen if the people on the inside don't have the same level of skill, if they don't have the same opportunity, and they're not um, just as much contributing. It was women with life sentences that, to this day, they say will never you know, see the other side of a fence that is the influential roots and foundation of my blackness, of my existence. And they have such an amazing role um, and valuable role to play, you know, inside of abolition. And so um, that's just been really tough, you know, um, to navigate. But I really feel like um, each of us, that there's so many people on the inside of this system and not just those who are incarcerated in the prisons, but those of us who are incarcerated in the schools and these social service programs and our bodies and our minds and our neighborhoods and our relationships that we cannot keep going back and forth on right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. I think every opportunity, um, especially if people are doing it with the right intentions to, um, you know, push back or destroy the system um, becomes an opportunity for another mother to come home, for another child to not have to repeatedly, you know, go through that um, cycle. And so not everybody's in it for the same reason, but I do believe that um, we who are abolitionists or we who are just as dedicated to the destruction of these justice systems um, have to be inside of it because that's where our people are. Um, I, I talk about it all the time, especially with law st students. You know, I live in Gainesville with the University of Florida. Uh, we could have a long list of how just destructive that institution is. But it wasn't until I started building relationships with the people inside that I had the compassion and the heart to say, if we just burn this down, there's some good people in here. There are professors incarcerated inside of those law schools, students incarcerated inside of those law students in those law schools. But we as community, when we pull them out to that free space, it gives them an opportunity to connect with us in a way that we can grow power, you know, in ways that we just uh, are not seeing in the mainstream, but we are experiencing, you know, um, in our own ways on the, I guess, in the grassroots area. So I personally believe abolitionists belong and we have to be in the system um, where people are that are impacted by it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and, and I totally agree with Jody. And, um, you know, for me, being you know, having incarcerated relatives, you know, which was the motivation for me to do all of the work that I do, but also, um, you know, using education as that um, as that avenue of freedom, if you will, in the abstract and in and in the literal sense, um, particularly for um, for black women who are in this system, for black women who are doing higher education in prison. And so um, I work through my organization with my colleagues called the Jami Sisterhood. And we are, you know, building that building that access and through this movement for black women um, in higher education in prison. So that includes the women who are inside, who are um, working on college degrees, women who are coming out of prison, um, you know, who want to continue their college education. And so, um, you know, when we talk about abolition and, 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 um, and reforming, you know, we are just really just focusing focusing on liberation, and you know, helping these women to, you know, to to really um, um, gain their freedom, whether they're going to be in prison for life or whether they're going to come home at some point. It's about their freedom, and we're offering that freedom through their education. And so, you know, it's it's it, you know, it's it, when you're doing this work on the inside um, and you're so personally invested in the work, it's, it's hard to, well, let me just speaking for myself, it's hard to code switch, right? I can't say, okay, right now I'm just going to be the professor teaching these classes. Um, and then when I'm done, I'm going to be the, the activist. And, and, but because for me, you know, it's, it's scholar activist, that's who I am. And so, you know, it, I don't think it's, it, people who are really doing this work, it is hard to to separate, you know, in, in compartmentalize because you have to be 100% in it in some way to effectively do it. 
Now reminded me too of just the legal empowerment um, formula that people have to be knowers and users before they can be shapers. Um, I came home and it seemed like the best strategy to go to law school to join the campaign to restore voting rights. And I mean, we did it. We're still doing it. And it was an amazing experience, but it was harmful um, to be cast out there as a shaper. And I had I didn't even know about the 13th Amendment. I didn't know at that time what my local elected officials did. And here I was in this big role of shaping. And so some amazing opportunities when people have had the opportunity to use their incarceration sentence, even though unfortunate, but be able to use those incarceration sentences for education, um, for building power, for learning these skills and, you know, learning ourselves and then be able um, to come home because those collateral consequences are still there. Um, you still have to go through them. Even though I was a Soros fellow, I still didn't, couldn't get housing, affordable, you know, safe housing. And so, um, we have to be very mindful about how we are using that advocacy on the inside and outside. And even with the participatory defense movement, we see so many lawyers in the beginning when we started doing that, um, in the pretrial that would not even ask a judge you know, for certain relief because they already knew how the state was. They already knew how the judges were. And we were there as community when our lawyer partners, you know, had the kind of cutting coats, which we didn't have no coat, you know, that we were stuck to. And so um, the more and more we just connect these inside out spaces, the more it truly just builds opportunity for us to all be visionaries, transformers and shapers of this justice system. Mm -hmm. Great question. No worries. You are all inspiring the questions from me. Um, so with the two minutes that we have left, I want to go in the same order that we started, uh, where you tell the attendees, the audience, one takeaway or one thing that they can do related to the theme or the work that you have spoken about um, here today. And you'll have 30 seconds to do that. Repeat that question. Um, just the one takeaway um, the, from the audience, like the, you want the audience to know. And we'll start with um, Mariam. I can't see. Thanks, Carla. Can you see me? Uh, one takeaway, gosh. Um, you know, I, I think for all this work that we're talking about, um, at least for me, it um, being able to connect with others makes it all feel um, doable. Um, and so for me, you know, I would encourage anyone who's listening um, or, or all of us on this panel too, to, to think about, you know, is, is there a new ally I can build in this work? Is there someone who, who I think has a spark of interest or a spark of potential or a spark of um, leadership that, that I see and, um, and I want to be in their orbit, you know, like, what can I do to connect with that person, which I, I you know, I, I do, I think relationships make everything um, more fun and, and more doable and, um, and build a future. So that that's one takeaway I would have. So my takeaway would be do not just be practitioners um, of your field, but um, also be solutionaries. Um, we know the data. We know the problem. We have all just come together around what that is. It's time for us to vision um, something new. Um, justice is going to look different than we ever seen it before. Do not be afraid to, to dream. Do not be afraid to hold on to the hope um, that is necessary, you know, even in this time of fear and um, disgust and break down any barrier by taking it to the streets, bring it to the community. The data shows you where the people are. And so go where people are, take yourself, you know, take your class or whatever that looks like, but practice on yourself, um, but share the movement with all of us. And my takeaway is simply to speak up. Now is not the time to be timid or bashful or shy or silent in any other way. Speak up, get out, get up, get out. 
you know, with your mask on, of course, <laughs> get involved and speak up. Um, I guess what I would want to leave everyone with is one, I feel like in the legal field, there's always a lag between what's going on with the law and what's going on with social sciences. And I wish that we could kind of close that a lot more. Um, I really want to focus on like systemic changes. Um, I think that there are so many progressive like prosecutors and defense attorneys, but like, what are we doing for the big picture? Um, Because I think those are going to have really, really far and wide reaching impacts. And finally, that this is a wonderful area because it gives us the opportunity to constantly learn and grow and heal. Thank you to all of you uh, panelists for spending the time with us, for sharing your stories, sharing your hopes and sharing your frustrations about legal education and again, training the next generation of criminal justice leaders. Uh, thank you to, to the attend uh, audience for uh, spending this hour with us. And with that, I will uh, end the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you.